Pariyati Audiobooks presents The Jhanas and the Lay Disciple According to the Pali Suttas From Investigating the Dhamma By Bhikkhu Bodhi Narrated by Jonathan Nelson The Jhanas and the Lay Disciple According to the Pali Suttas Part 1 Introduction The Pali Nikayas leave no doubt of the important role the jhanas play in the structure of the Buddhist path. In such texts as the Samanyafala Sutta, the Chulahatipadupama Sutta, and many others on the quote-unquote gradual training of the Buddhist monk, the Buddha invariably introduces the jhanas to exemplify the training in concentration. When the bhikkhu has fulfilled the preliminary moral discipline, we read, he goes off into solitude and cleanses his mind of the five hindrances. When his mind has been so cleansed, he enters and dwells in the four jhanas, described by a stock formula repeated countless times in the Nikayas. Here, bhikkhus, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination, with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. With the subsiding of thought and examination, he enters and dwells in the second jhana, which has internal confidence and unification of mind, is without thought and examination, and has rapture and happiness born of concentration. With the fading away, as well, of rapture, he dwells equanimous and, mindful and clearly comprehending, he experiences happiness with the body. He enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, quote, he is equanimous, mindful, and one who dwells happily, end quote. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, he enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant, and includes the purification of mindfulness by equanimity. In Theravada Buddhist circles during the past few decades, a debate has repeatedly erupted over the question whether or not jhana is necessary to attain the quote-unquote paths and fruits, that is, the four graded stages of enlightenment. The debate has been sparked off by the rise to prominence of the various systems of insight meditation that have become popular both in Asia and the West, especially among lay Buddhists. Those who advocate such systems of meditation contend that the paths and fruits can be attained by developing insight, or vipassana, without a foundation of jhana. This method is called the vehicle of bare insight or Sudha Vipassana, and those who practice in this mode are known as, quote, dry insiders, end quote, or Sukha Vipassaka, because their practice of insight has not been, quote unquote, moistened by prior attainment of the jhanas. Apparently, this system finds support from the Visuddhimagga and the Pali commentaries, though it is not given a very prominent place in the commentarial treatment of the path, which usually follows the canonical model in placing the jhanas before the development of insight. To help answer the question whether the jhanas are necessary for the attainment of the stages of awakening, we might narrow the question down by asking whether they are needed to reach the first stage of awakening, known as stream entry, or sotapati. Since the Nikayas order the process of awakening into four stages, stream entry, once returning, non-returning, and arahantship, it is possible that the jhanas come to assume an essential role at a later stage in the unfolding of the path, and not at the first stages. Thus, it may be that the insight required for the earlier stages does not presuppose prior attainment of the jhanas, while the jhanas become indispensable in making the transition from one of the intermediate stages to a more advanced stage. 
I myself believe there is strong evidence in the Nikayas that the jhanas become an essential factor for those intent on advancing from the stage of once returning to that of non-returner. I will review the texts that corroborate this thesis later in this paper. Recently, however, several articulate teachers of meditation have argued down the validity of the dry insight approach insisting that the jhanas are necessary for the successful development of insight at every stage. Their arguments usually begin by making a distinction between the standpoints of the Pali canon and the commentaries. On this basis, they maintain that from the perspective of the canon, jhana is needed to attain even stream entry. The Nikayas themselves do not address this problem in clear and unambiguous terms, and it is difficult to derive from them any direct pronouncement on its resolution. In the suttas dealing with the gradual training, all the stages of awakening are telescoped into one series, and thus no differentiation is made between the preparatory attainments required for stream entry, one's returning, non-returning, and arahantship. We simply see the monk go off into solitude, attain the four jhanas, and then proceed directly to arahantship, called, quote, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints, end quote. From such texts, there can be no denying the role of the jhanas in bringing the path to fulfillment. But here, I shall be concerned principally with the question whether or not they are categorically necessary to win the first fruit of the path. In pursuing this question, I intend to pick up an important but generally neglected clue the suttas lay at our doorstep. This is the fact that many of the Buddha's followers who attained the first three stages of awakening, from stream entry through non-returning, were lay people. The only stage that the canon depicts as the near-exclusive domain of monks and nuns is arahantship. This clue is more important than might appear at first glance, for a close examination of texts describing the personal qualities and lifestyles of noble lay disciples might bring to light just the material we need to unravel the knots tied into this perplexing issue. A study of the Nikayas as a whole would show that they depict classes of disciples in terms of paradigms or archetypes. These paradigms are generally constructed with extreme rigor and consistency, indicating that they are evidently governed by a precisely determined scheme. Yet, somewhat strangely, it is rare for the outlines of this scheme to be spelled out in the abstract. This puts the burden on us to elicit from the relevant suttas the underlying principle that govern the portrayal of types. The texts with which we are concerned delineate disciples at different levels of development by way of clusters of specific qualities and practices. These texts function both descriptively and prescriptively. They show us what kinds of qualities we can normally expect of disciples at particular stages of progress, and thereby they imply, and sometimes state, what kinds of practices an aspirant at a lower stage should take up to advance further along the path. To draw upon suttas dealing with lay disciples is to approach the question of the need for jhana from an angle somewhat different from the one usually adopted. Most participants in this discussion have focused on texts dealing principally with monastic practice. The drawback to this approach, as indicated above, lies in the predilection of the Nikayas to compress the successive levels of monastic attainment into a single, comprehensive scheme without showing how the various levels of practice are to be correlated with the successive stages of attainment. So, instead of working with these monastic texts, I intend to turn my spotlight on the unordained segment of the Buddhist community and look at suttas that discuss the spiritual practices and qualities of the lay noble disciple. 
for if the jhanas are truly necessary to attain stream entry, then they should be just as much integral to the practice of the lay follower as they are to the practice of the monk. And thus, we should find texts that regularly ascribe jhanic practice and attainment to lay disciples, just as we find them in the case of monks. If, on the other hand, the texts consistently describe the practices and qualities of certain types of noble lay disciples in ways that pass over or exclude the jhanas, then we have strong grounds for concluding that the jhanas are not prerequisites for attaining discipleship at these levels. I will frame my study around three specific questions. First, do the texts indicate that a worldling must attain jhana before entering upon the, quote, fixed course of rightness, end quote, the irreversible path to stream entry? Second, do the texts typically ascribe the jhanas to lay disciples who have attained stream entry? Third, if the texts do not normally attribute the jhanas to the stream enterer, is there any stage in the maturation of the path where their attainment becomes essential? Part 2. Jhana and the Attainment of Stream Entry Let us turn directly to the texts themselves to see if they can shed any light on our problem. When we do survey the Nikayas with this issue in mind, we find, perhaps with some astonishment, that they neither lay down a clear stipulation that jhana is needed to attain stream entry, nor openly assert that jhana is dispensable. The Sutta Pitaka mentions four preconditions for reaching the path, called Sotapatiyanga, factors of stream entry. Namely, one, association with superior people, as in, with the noble ones. 2. Listening to the true Dhamma. 3. Proper attention. 4. Practice in accordance with the Dhamma. It would seem that all the elements of Buddhist meditative practice, including the jhanas, should not come under the fourth factor, but the Nikayas themselves do not state whether, quote, practice in accordance with the Dhamma, end quote, includes the jhanas. The few texts that specify what is actually meant by practice in accordance with the Dhamma are invariably concerned with insight meditation. They employ a fixed formula with variable subjects to describe a bhikkhu practicing in such a way. Two suttas define such practice as aimed at the cessation of the factors of dependent origination. Another as aimed at the cessation of the five aggregates. And still another as aimed at the cessation of the six sense bases. Of course, meditation practice undertaken to attain the jhanas would have to be included in practice in accordance with the Dhamma, but the texts give no ground for inferring that such practice is a prerequisite for reaching stream entry. A stream enterer is endowed with four other qualities, mentioned often in the Sotapati Samyutta. These two are called Sotapati Yanga, but in a different sense than the former set. These are the factors that qualify a person as a stream enterer. The first three are confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The fourth is, quote, the virtues dear to the noble ones, end quote, generally understood to mean the inviolable adherence to the five precepts. From this, we can reasonably suppose that in the preliminary stage leading up to stream entry, the aspirant will need firm faith in the three jewels and scrupulous observance of the five precepts. Further, the realization of stream entry itself is often depicted as a cognitive experience of almost ocular immediacy. It is called the gaining of the eye of the Dhamma, the breakthrough to the Dhamma, the penetration of the Dhamma. 
one who has undergone this experience is said to have, quote, seen the Dhamma, reached the Dhamma, understood the Dhamma, fathomed the Dhamma, end quote. Taken together, both modes of description, by way of the four factors of stream entry and by way of the event of realization, indicate that the disciple has arrived at stream entry primarily through insight supported by unwavering faith in the three jewels. It is noteworthy that the texts on the realization of stream entry make no mention of any prior accomplishment in jhana as a prerequisite for reaching the path. In fact, several texts show the breakthrough to stream entry as occurring to someone without any prior meditative experience, simply by listening to the Buddha or an enlightened monk give a discourse on the Dhamma. While the process of quote-unquote entering the stream involves both faith and wisdom, individuals differ in their disposition with respect to these two qualities. Some are disposed to faith, others to wisdom. This difference is reflected in the division of potential stream enterers into two types, known as the Sadda Nusari, or faith follower, and the Dhamma Nusari, or Dhamma follower. Both have entered, quote, the fixed course of rightness, or Samatha Niyama, the irreversible path to stream entry by attuning their understanding of actuality to the nature of actuality itself, and thus for both, insight is the key to entering upon the path. The two types differ, however, in the means by which they generate insight. The faith follower, as the term implies, does so with faith as the driving force. Inspired by faith, he resolves on the ultimate truth and thereby gains the path. The Dhamma follower is driven by an urge to fathom the true nature of actuality. Inspired by this urge, he investigates the teaching and gains the path. When they have known and seen the truth of the Dhamma, they realize the fruit of stream entry. Perhaps the most informative source on the difference between these two types is the Okantika Samyutta, where the Buddha shows how they enter upon the fixed course of rightness. Quote, Bhikkhus, the eye is impermanent, changing, becoming otherwise. So too the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. One who places faith in these teachings and resolves on them thus is called a faith follower. He is one who has entered the fixed course of rightness, entered the plane of the superior persons, transcended the plane of the worldlings. He is incapable of doing any deed by reason of which he might be reborn in hell, in the animal realm, or in the sphere of ghosts. He is incapable of passing away without having realized the fruit of stream entry. One for whom these teachings are accepted thus to a sufficient degree by being pondered with wisdom, is called a Dhamma follower. He is one who has entered the fixed course of rightness. He is incapable of passing away without having realized the fruit of stream entry. One who knows and sees these teachings thus is called a stream enterer, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny with enlightenment as his destination. End quote. It is noteworthy that this passage makes no mention of jhana. While prior experience of jhana would no doubt help to make the mind a more fit instrument for insight, it is surely significant that jhana is not mentioned either as an accompaniment of the, quote, entry upon the fixed course of rightness, or as a prerequisite for it. It might be objected that several other passages on the two candidates for stream entry implicitly include the jhanas among their meditative equipment. The details of these passages need not concern us here. What is of interest to us is that they assign to both the faith follower and the dhamma follower the five spiritual faculties, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. 
the Indriya Samyutta states that the faculty of concentration, quote, is to be seen among the four jhanas, end quote. And a definition of the concentration faculty includes the formula for the jhanas. Thus, if we argue deductively from these ascriptions and definitions, it would seem to follow as a matter of logic that both the Dhamma follower and the faith follower possess the jhanas. More broadly, since these faculties and powers belong to all noble disciples, not to monks alone, this might be held up as proof that all noble disciples, monks, and lay followers invariably possess the jhanas. Such a conclusion would follow if we adopt a literal and deductive approach to the interpretation of the texts, but it is questionable whether such a hermeneutic is always appropriate when dealing with the formulaic definitions employed so often by the Nikayas. To extract the intended meaning from such schematic definition, we require greater sensitivity to context. Sensitivity guided by acquaintance with a wide assortment of relevant texts. Further, if we do opt for the literalist approach, then, since the passage simply inserts the formula for the four jhanas without qualification into the definition of the concentration faculty, we would have to conclude that all noble disciples, monks and lay followers alike, possess all four jhanas, not just one. Even more, they would have to possess the four jhanas already as faith followers and dhamma followers at the very entry to the path. This, however, seems too generous and indicates that we need to be cautious in interpreting such formulaic definitions. In the case presently being considered, I would regard the use of the jhana formula here as a way of showing the most eminent type of concentration to be developed by the noble disciple. I would not take it as a rigid pronouncement that all noble disciples actually possess all four jhanas, or even one of them. But there is more to be said. When we attend closely to these texts, we see that a degree of flexibility is already built into them. In the analysis of the faculties in the Sangyuta Nikaya, one sutta offers an alternative definition of the faculty of concentration that does not mention the four jhanas, while the following sutta gives both definitions conjointly. The alternative version runs thus, quote, And what, monks, is the faculty of concentration? Here, monks, a noble disciple gains concentration, gains one-pointedness of mind, having made release the object. This is called the faculty of concentration. End quote. The Nikayas themselves nowhere explain exactly what is meant by the concentration gained by, quote, having made release the object, end quote. But they do elsewhere suggest that release is a term for Nibbana. The commentary interprets this passage with the aid of the distinction between mundane and supramundane concentration. The former consists in the form sphere jhanas and the access to these jhanas the latter in the supramundane jhanas, concomitant with the supramundane path. On the basis of this distinction, the commentary explains, quote, the concentration that makes release the object, end quote, as the supramundane concentration of the noble path arisen with nibbana as object. Thus, if we feel obliged to interpret the faculty and power of concentration in the light of the jhana formula, we might go along with the commentary in regarding it as the supramundane jhana pertaining to the supramundane path and fruit. However, we need not agree with the commentaries in taking the expression, having made release the object, so literally. We might instead interpret this phrase more loosely as characterizing a concentration aimed at release, that is, directed towards Nibbana. Then we can understand its referent as the concentration that functions as the basis for insight, 
both initially in the preparatory phase of practice and later in the immediate conjunction with insight. This would allow us to ascribe to the noble disciple a degree of concentration strong enough to qualify as a faculty without compelling us to hold that he must possess jhana. Perhaps the combined definition of the concentration faculty in Samyutta Nikaya chapter 48 verse 10 is intended to show that two courses are open to disciples. One is the route emphasizing strong concentration, along which one develops the jhanas as the faculty of concentration. The other is the route emphasizing insight, along which one develops concentration only to the degree needed for insight to arise. This concentration, though falling short of jhana, could still be described as, quote, concentration that makes release its object, end quote. The faith follower and the dhamma follower are the lowest members of a sevenfold typology of noble persons mentioned in the Nikayas as an alternative to the more common scheme of the four pairs of persons, the four path attainers, and the realizers of their respective fruits. The seven fall into three groups, at the apex of the arahants, who are distinguished into two types, quote, both ways liberated arahants, end quote, who gain release from the taints together with deep experience of the formless attainments, and, quote, wisdom liberated arahants, end quote, who win release from the taints without such experience of the formless attainments. Next are three types in the intermediate range, from stream enterers up to those on the path to arahantship. These are the body witness, who has partly eliminated the taints and experiences the formless attainments, the view attainer, who does not experience the formless attainments and has partly eliminated the taints with emphasis on wisdom, and the faith liberated, who does not experience the formless attainments and has partly eliminated the taints with emphasis on faith. Any disciple at the six intermediate stages, from stream enterer to one on the path to arahantship, can fall into any of these three categories. The distinctions among them are not determined by degree of progress, but by mode of progress, whether through strong concentration, wisdom, or faith. Finally, come the two kinds of anusari, who are on the path to stream entry. What is noteworthy about this list is that samadhi, as a faculty, does not determine a class of its own until after the fruit of stream entry has been realized. That is, facility in concentration determines a distinct type of disciple among the arahants, as the both ways liberated arahant, and among the aspirants for the higher stages, as the body witness, but not among the aspirants for stream entry. In this lowest category, we have only the faith follower and the dhamma follower, who owe their status to faith and wisdom, respectively, but there is no type corresponding to the body witness. From the omission of a class of disciples training for stream entry who also enjoy the experience of the formless meditations, one might suppose that disciples below the level of stream entry cannot gain access to the formless attainments. This supposition is not tenable, however, for the texts show that many of the ascetics and contemplatives in the Buddha's day, including his two teachers before enlightenment, were familiar with the jhanas and formless attainments. Since these attainments are not dependent on the insight made uniquely available through the Buddha's teaching, the omission of such a class of jhana attainers among those on the way to stream entry must be explained in some other way than by the supposition that such a class does not exist. I would propose that while disciples prior to stream entry may or may not possess the formless attainments, skill in this area does not determine a distinct type because powerful concentration is not a governing factor in the attainment of stream entry. 
The way to stream entries certainly requires a degree of concentration sufficient for the, quote, eye of Dhamma, end quote, to arise, but the actual movement from the stage of a worldling to that of a path attainer is driven by either strong conviction or a probing spirit of inquiry, which respectively determine whether the aspirant is to become a faith follower or a Dhamma follower. Once, however, the path has been gained, then one's degree of accomplishment and concentration determines one's future mode of progress. If one gains the formless attainments, one takes the route of the body witness, culminating in release as a both ways liberated arahant. If one does not attain them, one takes the route of the view attainer, or faith liberated trainee, culminating in release as a wisdom liberated arahant. Since these distinctions relate only to the formless attainments and make no mention of the jhanas, it is reasonable to suppose that of the types, type 2, that is, wisdom liberated arahants, type 4, the view attainer, type 5, the faith liberated, and types 6 and 7, the two kinds of anusari, may have possession of the form sphere jhanas. But by making faith and wisdom the key factors in gaining the initial access to the path, this scheme leaves open the possibility that some stream enterers, and perhaps those at still higher levels, may not have gained these jhanas at all. Part 3. Jhana and Right Concentration Though the above discussion seems to imply that the path of stream entry might be reached without prior attainment of jhana, the thesis that jhana is necessary at every stage of enlightenment claims powerful support from the canonical account of the Noble Eightfold Path, which defines the path factor of right concentration, or Samma Samadhi, with the stock formula for the four jhanas. From this definition, it might be argued that since right concentration is integral to the path, and since the jhanas form the content of right concentration, the jhanas are indispensable from the first stage of awakening to the last. This conclusion, however, does not necessarily follow. Even if we agree that the definition of right concentration by way of the jhanas categorically means that the jhanas must be reached in the course of developing the path, this need not be taken to stipulate that they must be attained prior to attaining stream entry. It could be that attainment of jhana is necessary to complete the development of the path, becoming mandatory at a relatively late point in the disciple's progress. That is, it may be a prerequisite for reaching one of the higher paths and fruits, but may not be indispensable for reaching the first path and fruit. The Theravada exegetical system found in the Pali commentaries handles this issue in a different way. Based on the Abhidhamma's classification of states of consciousness, the commentaries distinguish two kinds of path. The preliminary or mundane path, and the supramundane path. Two kinds of jhanas, mundane and supramundane, correspond to these two kinds of path. The mundane jhanas are exalted states of consciousness, developed in the preliminary path as a preparation for reaching the supramundane path. Technically, they are quote-unquote form-sphere states of consciousness. That is, types of consciousness typical in the quote-unquote form realm and tending to rebirth in the form realm. The supramundane jhanas are supramundane states of consciousness, identical with the supramundane paths or fruits themselves. This distinction allows the commentaries to hold simultaneously two theses regarding the relation of jhana to the path. First, Every path and fruition attainment from the stage of stream entry up is also a jhana, and thus all path attainers are attainers of supramundane jhana. Second, not all path attainers have reached jhana in the preliminary path leading up to the supramundane path, and thus they need not be attainers of mundane or form sphere jhana. 
These two theses can be reconciled because the paths and fruits always occur at a level of concentration corresponding to one of the four jhanas, and thus may be considered jhanas in their own right, though jhanas of the supramundane rather than the mundane type. These jhanas are quite distinct from the mundane jhanas, the exalted states of concentration pertaining to the form sphere. As all path attainers necessarily attain supramundane jhana, they fulfill the definition of right concentration in the Noble Eightfold Path, but they may not have attained the form sphere jhanas prior to reaching the path. Those who do not attain jhana develop a lower degree of concentration, called access concentration, which they use as a basis to arouse insight and thereby reach the supramundane path. When those meditators who arouse insight without prior attainment of jhana reach the supramundane path, their path attainment occurs at the level of the first supramundane jhana. Those who have already cultivated the mundane jhanas prior to attaining the path, it is said, generally attain a path that occurs at a jhanic level corresponding to their degree of achievement in the practice of the mundane jhanas. Though the Nikayas do not clearly distinguish the two types of paths and jhanas, several suttas foreshadow this distinction, the most prominent among them being the Mahachatarisaka Sutta. The distinction becomes explicit in the Abhidhamma, where it is used as a basis for the definitions of the form sphere and supramundane wholesome states of consciousness. The commentaries go one step further and adopt this distinction as foundational to their entire method of exegesis. Although one is certainly not justified in reading the interpretive concepts of the commentaries into the canonical texts themselves, since the commentaries feel obliged to explain the definition of right concentration as the four jhanas in a way that does not imply all path attainers possess the form sphere jhanas. This makes it plain that they did not regard the form sphere jhanas as a prerequisite for attaining the path of stream entry. Part 4. The Stream Enterer and Jhana The contention between the two parties in the contemporary debate might be recapitulated thus. Those who assert that jhana is necessary for the attainment of stream entry usually insist that a mundane or form sphere jhana must be secured before one can enter the supramundane path. Those who defend the dry insight approach hold that a mundane jhana is not indispensable, that a lower degree of concentration suffices as a basis for the cultivation of insight and the attainment of the path. Both parties usually agree that jhana is part of the actual path experience itself. The issue that divides them is whether the concentration in the preliminary portion of the path must include a jhana. To decide this question, I wish to query the texts themselves and ask whether they show us instances of stream enterers who are not attainers of the jhanas. Now, while there are no suttas which flatly state that it is possible to become a stream enterer without having attained at least the first jhana, I think there are several that imply as much. First, let us start with the Chula Dukkha Khanda Sutta. The sutta opens when the Sakyan lay disciple, Maha Nama, identified by the commentary as a once returner, comes to the Buddha and presents him with a personal problem. Although he has long understood, through the guidance of the teaching, that greed, hatred, and delusion are corruptions of the mind, such states still arise in him and overpower his mind. This troubles him and makes him wonder what the underlying cause might be. In his reply, the Buddha says, quote, even though a noble disciple has clearly seen with perfect wisdom that sensual pleasures give little satisfaction and are fraught with suffering and misery, rife with greater danger, 
If he does not achieve a rapture and happiness apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, or something more peaceful than this, then he is not beyond being enticed by sensual pleasures. End quote. The first part of this statement implies that the subject is at least a stream enterer, for he is referred to as a quote unquote noble disciple. Though the term noble disciple is occasionally used in a loose sense that need not be taken to imply attainment of stream entry, here the expression quote, seeing with perfect wisdom, end quote, seems to establish his identity as at least a stream enterer. Yet, the second part of the statement implies he does not possess even the first jhana, for the phrase used to describe what he lacks, quote, a rapture and happiness apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, end quote, precisely echoes the wording of the basic formula for the first jhana. The state, quote, more peaceful than that, end quote, would, of course, be the higher jhanas. Second, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha speaks with reference to, quote, a lay follower clothed in white, end quote, of four pleasant dwellings in this very life pertaining to the higher mind. Now, in relation to monks, the Nikayas invariably use this expression to mean the four jhanas. If it were considered commonplace or even paradigmatic, for a lay disciple to attain the four jhanas, one would expect the Buddha to explain the above expression in the same way as he does for monks. But he does not. Rather, when he specifies what these quote-unquote pleasant abidings mean for the noble lay follower, he identifies them with the possession of the four quote-unquote factors of stream entry, namely, confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and possession of the virtues dear to the noble ones. This difference in explanation has important ramifications and is indicative of major differences in expectations regarding lay followers and monks. Third, in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Sakya noble Mahanama again approaches the Buddha and inquires about the meditative practice of a, quote, noble disciple who has reached the fruit and understood the message, end quote. Here again, it is clear from the epithets used that the question concerns a lay follower who has realized stream entry or some higher stage. Further, at the end of each expository section, the Buddha stresses the Aryan stature of the disciple with the words, quote, This is called Mahanama, a noble disciple who among unrighteous humanity has attained righteousness, who among an afflicted humanity dwells unafflicted, who has entered the stream of the Dhamma and develops recollection of the Buddha, end quote and so for each object of recollection. In his reply, the Buddha shows how the lay disciple takes up one of the six objects of recollection, the three jewels, morality, generosity, and the devas. As the disciple recollects each theme, his mind is not obsessed by lust, hatred, or delusion, but becomes upright. Quote, with an upright mind, he gains the inspiration of the goal, the inspiration of the Dhamma, gladness connected with the Dhamma. When he is gladdened, rapture arises, his body becomes tranquil, and he experiences happiness. For one who is happy, the mind becomes concentrated. End quote. As this passage shows, contemplation based on the Buddha and the other objects of recollection culminates in samadhi. Yet, the nature of this samadhi is not elucidated by way of the jhana formula. In fact, the Nikayas never ascribe to these reflective contemplations the capacity to induce jhana, and this is expressly denied in the commentaries, which hold that, because these meditation subjects involve intensive use of discursive thought, they can lead only as far as access concentration. 
It thus seems that the type of concentration typically available to a lay noble disciple at the stage of stream entry or once returning is access concentration. This, of course, does not mean that stream enterers and once returners don't attain the jhanas, but only that the standard doctrinal structure does not ascribe the jhanas to them as essential equipment. Fourth, nor does the above sutta imply that a lay stream enterer must remain content merely with excursions into access concentration and cannot develop the higher wisdom of insight. To the contrary, the Buddha includes the higher wisdom among the five excellent qualities he regularly ascribes to noble lay disciples. Faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom. In several suttas of the Sotapati Samyutta, generosity and wisdom even replace virtue as the fourth factor of stream entry, faith being included by quote-unquote confirmed confidence in the three jewels. We should note that we do not find among these qualities any mention of samadhi or a formula for the jhanas. Yet we see that wisdom is defined in exactly the same terms used to define the wisdom of a monk in training. It is, quote, the noble wisdom that discerns the arising and passing away of things, that is noble and penetrative, and leads to the complete destruction of suffering, end quote. Since the lay stream enterer or once returner is thus well equipped with the wisdom of insight, but is not typically described as a jhana attainer, this implies that attainment of jhana is not normally expected or required of him. From this, we can also conclude that at these early stages of the path, liberative wisdom does not depend on a supporting base of jhana. A text in the Sotapati Samyutta gives credit to this conclusion. In the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha explains to the Sakyan Nandiya how a noble disciple dwells diligently. He says that a noble disciple should not become complacent about possessing the four factors of stream entry, but should use these qualities as starting points for contemplation. Quote, he is not content with his confirmed confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, but strives further in seclusion by day and in retreat by night. As he dwells diligently, gladness arises. For one who is happy, the mind becomes concentrated. When the mind is concentrated, phenomena become manifest. It is with the manifestation of phenomena to him that he is reckoned as one who dwells diligently. The expression, quote-unquote, manifestation of phenomena, indicates that the disciple is engaged in contemplating the rise and fall of the five aggregates, the six sense bases, and so forth. Thus, this passage shows how the disciple proceeds from concentration to insight, but it does not describe this concentration in terms suggesting it occurs at the level of jhana. Since the sequence switches over from concentration to insight without mentioning jhana, it seems that the concentration attained will be tantamount to access concentration, not jhana, yet even this suffices to support the arising of insight. Part 5. When do the jhanas become necessary? While there seem to be no suttas that impose an inflexible rule to the effect that a lay noble disciple must possess the jhanas, there are at least two texts that explicitly ascribe all four jhanas to certain householders. One, found in the Chitta Samyutta, features Chitta, the householder, the foremost lay preacher, in a conversation with a naked ascetic named Kasapa. Kasapa was an old friend of Chitta who had embraced the life of renunciation thirty years earlier, and this is apparently their first meeting since that time. 
Kasapa confesses to Chitta that in all these years, he has not achieved any, quote, superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision befitting the noble ones, end quote. All he does is go about naked, with a shaved head, using a feather brush to sweep his seat. He then asks Chitta whether, as a lay disciple of the Buddha, he has reached any distinguished attainments. Chitta says that he has, and then declares his ability to enter and dwell in the four jhanas. He uses the standard formula. To this, he adds, quote, Further, if I were to die before the Blessed One, it would not be surprising if the Blessed One would declare of me, there is no fetter bound by which Chitta, the householder, might come back to this world. Through this bit of coded text, partly a stock formulation, Chitta is informing his friend that he is a non-returner with access to the four jhanas. The other sutta is in the Anguttara Nikaya, and concerns the laywoman Nandamata. In the presence of the venerable Sariputta and other monks, Nandamata has been disclosing the seven wonderful and marvelous qualities with which she is endowed. The sixth of these is possession of the four jhanas, again described by the stock formula. The seventh is as follows. Quote, as to the five lower fetters taught by the Blessed One, I do not see among them any as yet unabandoned in myself. End quote. This, too, is a coded way of declaring her status as a non returner. Such are the reports that have come down in the Sutta Pitaka about two lay followers who possess both the four jhanas and the status of non returner. Whether these two achievements are inseparably connected or not is difficult to determine on the basis of the Nikayas, but there are several texts that lend support to this conclusion. One sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya ranks the four classes of noble disciples in relation to the threefold higher training, consisting of the higher virtue, the higher mind, and the higher wisdom. Just below, the Buddha explains the training in the higher virtue as the restraint of the parimokkha, the code of monastic rules, the training in the higher mind as the four jhanas, defined by the usual formula, and the training in the higher wisdom as either the knowledge of the four noble truths or liberation from the taints, according to the Anguttara Nikaya. Although the Buddha's treatment of this topic is governed by a monastic context, the principles of classification can easily be extended to lay disciples. Returning to the Anguttara Nikaya, we learn that the stream enterer and the once returner have fulfilled the training in the higher virtue, which for a lay disciple would mean possession of the virtues dear to the noble ones but have accomplished the other two trainings only partly. The non-returner has fulfilled the trainings in the higher virtue and the higher mind, but accomplished the training in the higher wisdom only partly. And the arahant has fulfilled all three trainings. Now, since the non-returner has fulfilled the training in the higher mind, and this is defined as the four jhanas, he is probably an attainer of the jhanas. It might still be questioned, however, whether he must possess all four jhanas. While a literal reading of the above sutta would support this conclusion, if we bear in mind my earlier comments about interpreting stock formulas, we might conjecture that the training in the higher mind is fulfilled by the secure attainment of even one jhana. This seems to be confirmed by the Mahamalyunkya sutta, which shows how the attainment of jhana figures in the preliminary phase of the path to the stage of non-returner. At a certain point in his discourse, the Buddha announces that he will teach, quote, the path and way for the abandoning of the five lower fetters, end quote. He underscores the importance of what he is about to explain with a great simile. 
just as it is impossible to cut out the heartwood of a great tree without first cutting through the bark and the softwood, so it is impossible to cut off the five lower fetters without relying on the path and practice he is about to make known. This lays down categorically that the procedure to be described must be exactly followed to win the promised goal, the eradication of the five lower fetters, which is the defining achievement of the non-returner. The Buddha then explains the method. The meditator enters into one of the four jhanas, or the lower three formless attainments. The text takes up each in turn and dissects it into its constituents, form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness in the case of the four jhanas. The same, but omitting form, for the three formless attainments. He next contemplates these phenomena in eleven ways, as impermanent, suffering, a disease, a boil, a dart, misery, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and non-self. Then, when his contemplation reaches maturity, he turns his mind away from these things and directs it to the deathless element, as in Nibbana. Quote, If he is firm in this, he reaches Arahantship right on the spot, But if he holds back slightly due to attachment and delight in the Dhamma, then he eliminates the five lower fetters and becomes a spontaneous ariser, who attains final Dibbana there in a celestial realm, without ever returning from that world. The Maha Malunkya Sutta thus makes the attainment of jhana a necessary part of the preparatory practice for attaining the stage of non-returner. Though the sutta discusses the practice undertaken by a monk, since the Buddha has declared this to be, quote, the path and practice for abandoning the five lower fetters, end quote, we are entitled to infer that lay practitioners, too, must follow this course. This would imply that a once-returner who aspires to become a non-returner should develop at least the first jhana in the preliminary phase of the path, using the jhana as the launching pad for developing insight. While the Maha Malunkya Sutta and its parallel in the Anguttara Nikaya imply that prior attainment of the first jhana is a minimum requirement for reaching the fruit of non-returning, we may still query whether this is an invariable rule or merely a general stipulation that allows for exceptions. Several suttas suggest the latter may in fact be the case. In two consecutive texts, the Buddha extols the, quote, eight wonderful and marvelous qualities, end quote, of two followers named Uga. In the first, he declares that Uga of Vesali has abandoned all five fetters, as for Nandamatta above. In the second, he says that Uga of Hatigama has no fetters bound by which he might come back to this world, as for Chitta. Yet, though he thus confirms their standing as non-returners, the Buddha does not mention jhanic attainments among their eight wonderful qualities. This, of course, need not be taken to mean that they lacked attainment of jhana. It may have been that their jhanic skills were less remarkable than the other qualities they possessed or they may have been adept in only one or two jhanas, rather than in all four. But it does leave open the possibility that they were non-returners without jhana. Still another suggestive text is the Digavu Sutta. Here, the Buddha visits a lay follower named Digavu, who is gravely ill. He first enjoins the sick boy to acquire confirmed confidence in the three jewels, and the virtues dear to the noble ones, that is, to become a stream-enterer. When Digavu declares that he already possesses these qualities, the Buddha tells him that since he is established in the four factors of stream-entry, he should, quote, 
strive further to develop six qualities that partake of true knowledge, end quote. Quote, you should dwell contemplating the impermanence of all formations, perceiving suffering in what is impermanent, perceiving non-self in what is suffering, perceiving abandonment, perceiving dispassion, perceiving cessation. Digavu assures the Blessed One that he is already practicing these contemplations, and the Master leaves. A short time later, Digavu dies. On hearing the news of his death, the monks approach the Buddha to ask about his future rebirth. The Buddha declares that Digavu, the lay follower, had eradicated the five lower fetters and was spontaneously reborn as a non-returner. Here, the transition from stream entry to non-returning occurs entirely through a series of contemplations that pertain to insight. There has been no exhortation to develop the jhanas, yet through the practice of the, quote, six things partaking of true knowledge, end quote, Digavu has severed the five fetters and gained the third fruit of the path. A theoretical foundation for Digavu's approach might be gleaned from another sutta. In the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha contrasts two kinds of non-returners one who attains final nibbana without exertion, and one who attains final nibbana with exertion. The former is one who enters and dwells in the four jhanas described by the stock formula. The latter practices instead the quote-unquote austere meditations, such as the contemplation of the foulness of the body, reflection on the repulsiveness of food, disenchantment with the whole world, perception of impermanence in all formations, and recollection of death. Again, there is no categorical assertion that the latter is altogether bereft of jhana, but the contrast of this type with one who gains the four jhanas suggests this as a possibility. Though the possibility that there might be non-returners without jhanas cannot be ruled out, from the Nikayas we can elicit several reasons why we might normally expect a non-returner to have access to them. One reason is inherent in the very act of becoming a non-returner. The meditator eradicates two fetters that had been merely weakened by the once-returner, sensual desire and ill will. Now, these two fetters are also the first two among the five hindrances, the defilements to be abandoned to gain the jhanas. This suggests that by eradicating these defilements, the non-returner permanently removes the main obstacles to concentration. Thus, if his mind so inclines, the non-returner should not find it difficult to enter upon the jhanas. Another reason why non-returners should be gainers of the jhanas, while stream-enterers and once-returners need not be so, pertains to their future destination in samsara. Though all three types of disciple have escaped the plane of misery, as in rebirth in hell, the animal realm, and the sphere of ghosts, stream-enterers and once-returners are still liable to rebirth in the sensuous realm, while non-returners are utterly freed from the prospect of such a rebirth. What keeps the former in bondage to the sensuous realm is the fetter of sensual desire, which remains inwardly unabandoned by them. If they succeed in attaining the jhanas, they can suppress sensual desire and the other mental hindrances, and thus achieve rebirth in the form or formless realms. But this is not fixed for noble disciples at the lower two stages, who normally expect only a fortunate rebirth in the human realm or the sense sphere heavens. Non-returners, on the other hand, are so called precisely because they never again return to the sensuous realm. They have eliminated sensual desire, observe celibacy, and enjoy a high degree of facility in meditation. At death, 
the non-returner takes rebirth spontaneously in the form realm, generally in the pure abodes, and attains final nibbana there without ever returning from that world. The non-returner severs all connection with the sensuous realm by eliminating the fetter of sensual desire, and this establishes a certain correspondence between the non-returner and the ordinary jhana attainer. The texts sometimes speak of the worldling jhana attainer as, quote, an outsider devoid of lust for sensual pleasures, end quote. If he retains mastery over ajana at the time of death, his sublime kamma leads him to rebirth in the form realm, the specific plane of rebirth being determined by his degree of mastery over the jhanas. However, while both the ordinary jhana attainer and the non-returner are devoid of sensual desire and bound for rebirth in a non-sensuous realm, the two are divided by deep and fundamental differences. The ordinary jhana attainer has not fully eliminated any fetters and thus, with a slip of mindfulness, can easily fall victim to sensuality. The non-returner, in contrast, has cut off sensual desire and ill will at the root, ensuring that they will never again arise in him. He is not reborn in the form realm merely through the wholesome kamma generated by the jhanas, like the ordinary jhana attainer, but because he has eradicated the two fetters that bind even the once returner to the sensuous realm. This difference implies still another difference concerning their long-term fate. The ordinary jhana attainer, after being reborn in the form realm, eventually exhausts the powerful, meritorious kamma responsible for this sublime rebirth and might then take rebirth in the sensuous realm, even in the nether world. The non-returner, on the other hand, never falls away. Set firmly on the path of the Dhamma, the non-returner who is reborn in the form realm continues to develop the path without ever regressing until he attains final Nibbana within the form realm itself. Part 6. Conclusions and an Afterthought Our study has led us to the following conclusions regarding the relationship between lay noble disciples and the jhanas. First, Several suttas describe the process by which a worldling enters, quote, the fixed course of rightness, end quote, in a way that emphasizes either faith or wisdom as the chief means of attainment. None of the texts, however, that deal with the two candidates for stream entry, the faith follower and the dhamma follower, show them as being proficient in the jhanas. Though some suttas include the jhanas in the analysis of the faculty of concentration, this may be done simply out of compliance with the formulaic style of definition employed by the Nikayas and need not be seen as having categorical implications. The commentaries treat these definitions as referring to the supramundane jhana arisen within the supramundane path. Moreover, the analysis of the concentration faculty mentions another type of concentration, which is gained, quote, by making release the object, end quote, and this may be interpreted broadly enough as including degrees of concentration short of the jhanas. Second, all noble disciples acquire the right concentration of the noble eightfold path, which is defined as the four jhanas. This need not be understood to mean that stream enterers and once returners already possess jhana before they reach stream entry. The formula for right concentration may imply only that they must eventually attain the jhanas in the course of developing the path to its culmination in arahantship. If we go along with the commentaries in recognizing the Abhidhamic distinction between the preparatory path and the supramundane path, 
then we can maintain that the jhanas included in right concentration as a path factor pertain to the supramundane path and are thus of supramundane stature. This still leaves open the question whether aspirants for stream entry must develop the mundane jhanas in the preliminary phase of their practice. Third, a number of texts on stream enterers and once returners imply that they do not possess the jhanas as meditative attainments which they can enter at will. Though it is obvious that disciples at the lower two levels may have jhanic attainments, the latter are not declared to be an integral part of their spiritual equipment. Fourth, several non-returners in the Nikayas claim to possess all four jhanas, and according to the Maha Malunkya Sutta, attainment of at least the first jhana is part of the practice leading to the eradication of the five lower fetters. It thus seems likely that stream enterers and once returners, desirous of advancing to non-returnership in that very same life, must attain at least the first jhana as a basis for developing insight. Those content with their status, prepared to let the, quote, law of the Dhamma, end quote, take its course, generally will not strive to attain the jhanas. Instead, they settle for the assurance that they are bound to reach the final goal within a maximum of seven more lives passed in the human and celestial worlds. Fifth, as non-returners have eliminated sensual lust and ill will, the main obstacles to jhanic attainment, they should face no major problems in entering the jhanas. The non-returner is similar to the ordinary jhana attainer in being bound for rebirth in the form realm. Unlike the latter, however, the non-returner is utterly free from sensual desire and ill will, and thus can never fall back to the sensuous realm. Sixth, although in the Nikayas, the tie between the two attainments, the jhanas and non-returnership, is clear enough, it remains an open question whether the connection is absolutely binding. Several suttas speak of the achievements of non-returners without mentioning the jhanas, and at least one sutta contrasts the non-returner who gains all four jhanas with one who practices more austere types of meditation that do not typically lead to the jhanas. The commentaries even speak of a sukha vipassaka arahant, an arahant who has gained the goal entirely through quote-unquote dry insight without any attainment of form sphere jhana at all. Although such a type is not explicitly recognized in the Nikayas, the question may be raised whether the commentaries, in asserting the possibility of arahantship without attainment of jhana in the mundane portion of the path, have deviated from the canon or brought to light a viable possibility implicit in the older texts. The famous Satipatthana Sutta declares, in its conclusion, that all those who earnestly dedicate themselves to uninterrupted practice of the four establishments of mindfulness are bound to reap one of two fruits, either arahantship in this very life, or, if any residue of clinging remains, the stage of non-returning. While several exercises within the Satipatthana Sutta are certainly capable of inducing the jhanas, the system as a whole seems oriented towards direct insight rather than towards the jhanas. Thus, this opens the question whether the Satipatthana Sutta might not be propounding a way of practice that leads all to the way of non-returning, even to arahantship, without requiring attainment of the jhanas. This, however, is another question, one that lies beyond the scope of this paper. This has been The Jhanas and the Lay Disciple According to the Pali Suttas from Investigating the Dhamma by Bhikkhu Bodhi, narrated by Jonathan Nelson. 
Copyright 2015, Buddhist Publication Society. Audio Production Copyright 2023, Pariyati. Pariyati, a non-profit 501c3 organization, offers a wide variety of books, e-books, videos, and audiobooks about the teachings of the Buddha, the Pali language, and Vipassana meditation. Browse our complete catalog at www.pariyatti.org.